the moderator and discussant for this afternoon. He presently heads the Department of History at Bukhara University. Uh, his areas include uh, ancient India, political history, environmental history, and historiography. And uh, we are very thankful to him as well for kindly agreeing to be with us and uh, have the discussion today. Uh, so without much further ado, I take the pleasure of inviting Dr. Kaur to present his lecture. Thank you. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, yes, of course, yes. I hope you can all see it. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jayadeep, for that very kind introduction. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Professor Dash. Thanks, Sonanda, and everyone for taking time off your schedule to attend this. I must apologize at the beginning that this is not yet a fully finished paper, rather a set of very rudimentary points that I wanted to share with you today, uh, primarily to get your initial feedback. In the interest of extended discussion, I would try not to use up uh, the entirety of the time that has been allocated for the lecture. Uh, because of my current location, uh, my opportunity to interact with uh, such a knowledgeable audience is very limited. Therefore, I would like to make full use of that. Uh, it is a matter of great delight to be back in Assam, even if only digitally. I'm deeply grateful to the Krishnakanta Handikai State Open University for inviting me to deliver this lecture named after the earliest pathfinder of our field. It is an absolute honor. In fact, today, I want to start with a letter written by uh, Professor Bhuya in 1945 to one of his sons when the latter um, got the, sorry, uh, this thing is not moving. When the latter, uh, the, the son got a position in the British Indian bureaucracy at Tura, uh, the um, headquarters of the Garo Hills district. Uh, my heart is at peace now that you are an extra assistant commissioner, the highest career which one of our position can expect to attain. The 51-year-old father wrote to his son. He himself was working as an officer, uh, the provincial publicity officer of Assam at that time, a veteran with long acquaintance of the ways of the frontier establishment. He crammed all useful career advice he could think of for his son in three closely typed pages how he must keep the DC, the deputy commissioner, well pleased, how he should avoid making uncharitable remarks about his colleagues, how he should familiarize himself with the area and what books he needs to read for that, how he should start saving, how seriously he should take the departmental exams and so on. But I'm particularly taken by uh, this uh, sentence in Dr. Bhuya's letter, and I quote, there is no subject with which an ESC, an extra assistant commissioner, will not have to deal, either in his executive or judicial capacity, from matriarchy down to the supply of master oil. And the meticulous historian was being literal here. Officering in the Northeastern frontier of British India certainly involved dealing with matriarchy, with mustard oil, and with a great deal of things in between. In today's lecture, however, the focus is not so much on what the officers did or did not deal with, but on something that Dr. Bhuya repeatedly emphasized in this lecture, experience. It is the duty of every parent to give the children the benefit Sorry, my screen is slightly moving. 
the benefit of his or her experience. Experience, which is generally bought at a very high price. Dr. Vuya wrote in the end, all this advice he said elsewhere in the letter was to cover the gaps of your inexperience. He was talking to his son. Seek out and consult the experienced colleagues he instructed the new officer to be. Indeed, anyone familiar with the ways of the middle-class Indian elders will not find anything unusual in this letter. But if we begin to try and think for a moment at what particular point in history this uncountable noun, experience, came to be thought of as a thing that could be bought at a price, a high price of past mistakes, presumably, could be acquired and bequeathed, learned and handed down, and could even be encashed for career promotion. New ways of thinking about personhood and property may begin to emerge. I can certainly not aspire to offer a comprehensive examination of such a broad and decidedly philosophical issue in less than 50 minutes. My hope is rather just that by treating the category and tropes of experience historically in its peculiar career within a frontier bureaucracy, I can encourage you to think somewhat differently about the banality of power. The specific salience of this question in the history of the Indian Northeast will become clear when you remember how for the last 200 years, experience has been cited both as a rationale for rule and a ground for contestation, as an asset of administration and as an appeal to the unquantifiable and the lived. It is my contention that when we look at the network of capillary techniques that stretches across and binds these two semantic poles, the polarity seems to pose less of a riddle. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let us start on a farmer familiar ground. What were the qualities of an ideal frontier officer beside Bhunya's promptings to his son? In fact, when pressed for details, the Secretary of State had to admit in 1936 that his office knew of no specific work on the duties of frontier officers in India. Although, the Secretary said, a fair amount of information regarding the administration of tribal areas and the functions of the political agents in charge of them were available in the gazetteers. Certainly, Working in the tribal frontiers was not a formal specialization. A relatively small percentage of the officers spent the whole or even most of their careers in these hills. And yet, even a cursory glance at the English archive makes it amply clear that suitability and success of frontier officers were measured against rather specific expectations. It is not my purpose here to create, to recreate a colonial memo that was never written. It may, however, be useful to look at a post-colonial wish list. We ought to be careful about appointing officers anywhere, but we must be doubly so when we appoint them in tribal areas. Nehru told his experts in 1952, an officer in the tribal areas should not merely be a man who has passed an examination or gained some experience of routine work. An unenthusiastic officer who just sat in an office for a few hours a day and for the rest 
cast his fate for having been sent to an out of the way place would be completely useless. So Nehru said, the man who goes there as an officer must be prepared to share his life with the tribal folk. He must be prepared to enter their hearts, talk to them, eat and smoke with them, live their lives and not consider himself superior or apart. Then only can he gain their confidence and respect and thus be in a position to advise them. Nehru's officer, therefore, was to go to these people with friendship and affection, to develop a sense of oneness with these people, a sense of unity and understanding, and to particularly try a psychological approach. These are all his words, of course. Indeed, Nehru underscored the importance of psychological integration of tribal frontiers with the new nation state. Changes that he called much more basic and intimate than mere political integration. Particularly because the whole of the Northeast, and I'm quoting Nehru again, the whole of the Northeast frontier had been conditioned differently during the past generation and even in more recent years. His words again. So this was 1952. Within six years, the imposition of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act would horrifyingly illustrate the limits of the psychological approach. And in another six years, the government of India would secretly invite the old British officer Charles Posse back to the new state of Nagaland to work his charm to persuade the insurgent independentists that the union with India was the only solution. This is Posse, but this is a, a picture from the 1940s. What is this undying power of colonial officering into which the post-colonial state cannot help but tapping? This popular Raj nostalgia in post-colonial Mizoram that David Zhu writes about. The 1965 Mokokchong Town Hall meeting felicitated Charles Posse saying, there be hardly any village in the Nagaland which you had not visited. A great and able administrator as you are, you marched on foot from village to village. Your deep experience of the Naga people makes you a perfect arbiter. Experience seems to have a special purchase in frontier administration on all sides of the divide. Its ubiquity in the colonial archive often makes us forget the historical conditions for the emergence of this ubiquity. Its role in nurturing a climate of juridical and administrative exceptionalism exactly the kind that we have come to associate with the Northeastern frontier of British and post-British India. If it appears nebulous to us, its imprecision was the precise motor of its productivity. But in order to understand their imbrication, we must not treat the two, experience and exceptionalism, as totalized conditions existing from the beginning of the colonial sequence. As early as 1832, Adam White emphasized a fundamental quality of a good frontier officer in his homage to the recently expired David Scott, the ability to think outside the box. Scott, according to him, had had that mastermind which, throwing aside all the technicalities of the regulations, could grasp at once the spirit of the British system. To go by White's account, Frontier was no place 
for a literalist. The officer had to have a certain openness and readiness of mind, a capacity to imagine and improvise, a sort of courage that could ignore the letter of the law in order to pursue and accomplish its higher purposes. This was why, quite argued, Scott was able to exercise power beneficially by combining elements of a European rule book with a proper attention to the peculiar customs and prejudices of the Assamese. That is his phrase, of course. As far as the frontier was concerned, the antithesis between the letter and the spirit of the law was a rhetorical constant in the echo chamber of British Indian bureaucracy. About 130 years later, Hutton paid the same tribute to Mills for having possessed, and I'm quoting here, a ready ability to run rings round inconvenient regulations. That in order to be effective, a frontier officer must have wider discretionary power in enforcing law than his hinterland colleagues was consistently maintained by the local administration. Notwithstanding occasional rebukes and revocations, the Calcutta, Simla, and London authorities seemed more or less reconciled to this view. I will not have the time to elaborate this point here, but it is very important to remember that this did not start as an administrative practice exclusively targeted at frontiers. Rather, the discretionary powers of the local officers common to the early 19th century officers across three presidencies endured and expanded within the Northeastern frontier bureaucracy as more and more theoretical territory, that's a British officer's phrase, came to be added to the ill-mapped frontier. Why, citing the lack of infrastructure and revenue deficit, the central administration refused to proportionally expand the personnel. Officering in the frontier, therefore, of necessity had to be a creative art of making do. As one officer matter-of-factly remarked, there is plenty of rough work and plenty of play for one's wits in order to adapt means to an end and use a wild and crude people." End of quote. Apart from the playful ability to sidestep legal formalities, Hutton listed some of the other critical attributes of an exemplary frontier officer in his short obituary of J.P. Mills. Intimate knowledge of the people, tolerant outlook, a penchant for careful and accurate recording of data, whether anthropological or merely official, and most critically, fluency in tribal languages. If we collate some of the scattered ruminations on the subject by others in the business others in the business over the 120 years of British rule in Assam to add to this list. The frontier officer was variously expected uh, to be medically self-sufficient, scientifically gifted, um, and physically fit. He could not afford to be temperamental, particularly too impulsive, he had to be impervious to long marches and open to revolting means. He had to learn to live a lonely life in his outpost of empire without a family. Carson, famously, if you look at the right side of his screen, that's Carson. Carson's, Carson famously identified the complex qualifications of the modern school of pioneers. 
and he identified them as courage and conciliation, patience and tact, initiative and self-restraint, uh, that they have to have an instinctive gift of sympathy with native tribes. And to these attainments should be added for the ideal frontier officer, a taste for languages, some scientific training and a powerful physique. Again, this looks more like a wish list than a description. The colonial martyrology is replete with references to rash, impulsive hotheads, Adam White, Noel Williamson, Holcomb, Butler, Damant, the list is not short. Complaints about the unhealthiness of the Assam climate abound in the English archive. Assistant Commissioner Big saying in 1839 that this was the cause of the constant uncertainty which attaches to all appointments in Assam where no officer on the highest situations can expect to remain fixed for any period of more than a few months. Brody died very young of jungle fever, apparently trying to emulate and rival the Khasis in deeds of hardihood. Scott's own death was attributed to the insalubrious climate. Most could not operate without the help of the Dobashis or interpreters. Courage, sympathy, tolerance, a few hours in the archive will yield more than enough contradictory materials. No, the ideal type of frontier officers, whether coming from Karzan or from Hutton, did not exactly exist, at least not in any empirical individual. The historiography of paternalism will tell us at this point that it is a stylistic template, starting probably with the 18th century collector in Bhagalpur, Augustus Cleveland, whose system of conciliation of the Paharias in the Rajmahal Hills was perceived to be innovative, frame-breaking and effective, notwithstanding the fragility of his arrangements. The first chief commissioner of Assam, David Scott, was in fact dubbed the second Cleveland. And in the many seminar eulogies written after his death at 45, references to his intimate knowledge of the terrain and the tribes and his out of the box thinking abounded. And partly the historiography of paternalism will be right. There are excellent works in this tradition in South Asian history from the unforgettable classic of Eric Stokes in the 1950s to the magnificent Great Agrarian Conquest, published by Niladri Bhattacharya in 2018. In each other's company, they illuminate the ideological contours of the conflicting and overlapping corpuses of paternalism, utilitarianism, and million liberalism. But I want to go with this wish list in a slightly different direction. I do not want to take my eyes off experience whose discursive success makes its technical making invisible. In this sense, experience is a black box in this historiography. As Bruno Latour explains the work of black boxing, and I quote, when a machine runs efficiently, when a matter of fact is settled, one need focus only on its inputs and outputs and not on its internal complexity." End of quote. To think of experience as a machine in this precise sense, which is opaque because it works, is to directly contest the particular semantic frame in which frontier officering was couched at the end of the 19th century. Let me quickly give you the two most famous examples. In 1893, Frederick Turner read the significance of the frontier in American history before the American Historical Association in Chicago, as the city was holding the World's Columbian Exposition. And in 1907, the Indian Viceroy, George Garzon, 
delivered the 16th Romanist lectures in Oxford on frontiers. As you can see on the screen, both seized on a particular opposition between the rule-bound machine of modern governance and the bricolor poetic energy of the frontiersmen. The interesting thing to note is that for Tana, the settler theorist, this lack of formation of elaborate governmental institutions, the organized machinery of justice, as he calls it, resulted in what he called the unchecked development of the individual. This, for him, was the most significant product of a quote unquote frontier democracy. For Carson, and he too defines the outskirts of empire where the machine is relatively important and the individual is strong. But for him, on the contrary, this was the distilled imperial ethos. Outside of the English universities, Carson wrote, no school of character exists to compare with the frontier. And character is there molded not by attrition with fellow men in the arts or studies of peace, but in the fondness of responsibility and on the unveil of self-reliance. Both these texts speak of frontier as an experience, but also as a consinity of techniques. In the black box of experience, all these bucket list items All these bucket list items, inputs, however multiple and however heterogeneous, are mystically transformed into a single constant output of frontier governance. Precisely because techniques can operate indifferently to the ideological template, they can be harnessed simultaneously to frontier democracy and frontier colonialism. Between the publications of Turner and Carson in 1899, George Henderson published an essay on frontier warfare in India, drawing on recent histories of both Northeastern and Northwestern frontiers, where he was making a very similar case for improvisation, discretionary power, and intimate knowledge of the terrain and the tribes. One of his recurring complaints was that despite a long tradition of the British Indian Army to fight difficult wars in the remote and inaccessible hills, the British Indian Army could not benefit from its past experience. This was because, he wrote, experience was regarded as the private property of individuals, not as a public asset to be applied to the benefit of the army as a whole. This line, more succinctly than all my ramblings, sums up the conceptualization of experience as a government fund, a public asset, a common resource from which individual generals can successively draw. For the frontier officers, the imperative of making experience a linguistic event, an epistemological phenomenon that is discursively organized in particular configurations, cohered in the form of a particular genre two diaries. I do not have to tell this audience how critical Turing was, to, how critical Turing was in the scheme of governance in the Northeastern frontier. In most stretches of the frontier, for almost the entire period under consideration, direct state actions in the hills such as tax, tax collections, magistrate courts, expeditions, surveys, and tours were confined to three to four winter months. 
In these months, officers were often on the road to the hills and more consistently from 1861, were advised to keep their detailed tour diaries, noting down the details of the daily events, including numbers of marches, calculation of distance and direction, location of possible coolie supplying villages, useful contacts, descriptions of unusual or profitable botanical, zoological, or geological specimens, and so on. The very form of the tour diary, organized under individual dates, as you can see uh, on the screen here, it foregrounded the everyday, the everyday in the exceptional zone. From the 1870s, this genre began to become more and more substantive in both size and quality in the hill districts, reaching almost an art forms in the hands of the likes of Woodthorpe and Hutton. The former would also beautifully illustrate them, but most would do short sketches. As you can see on the screen, I do not The data, I think he lost his connection. Yeah, yeah, he will join. He said this. He said this earlier also that there might be a power cut. So uh, we will wait for one or two minutes. Okay, okay. He will rejoin. Nanda, hello, Joy Deep. Oh, man, how what to do now? Because he said that he will be dis he might be disconnected. Yeah, exactly, he told us. He told us there might be some power disconnect. Yeah. So, so, so any alternative ways to 
Now he said that he will be joining from mobile. So I'm just waiting to get his mobile, you know, connected. I'm looking at it. But meanwhile, what should we do? We should, uh, should we, uh, you know, because, because it is in between. Probably he has something to say more. So, I'll wait for five minutes. Right, right, sir. Sometimes. I'll wait for five more minutes, then uh, probably you can continue. Yes, yes, he's joining, he's joining, he's joining. He has joining. covered almost uh, 95% of his uh, matter. He, he, has, so he, has joined, he has joined, he has joined. Nabangku, make him host. Bodhi? Yeah, yeah, doing, doing. And also, Midus Mita host. Yes, Bodhi. No, I, I, I can see you, but I can't hear you. Uh, his audio is not connected. Yeah, audio. It seems that your audio is not connected. I can see you, but I cannot hear you. Or maybe you can try reconnecting the device once again. I mean, that, that will be once that will be fine, probably.
I think he has joined, but he again his audio is not connected. He is here. Yes, now he. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Hello, sorry, yes, yes, everybody. Yes. I'm so sorry. The worst oh, has it's happened. Okay. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. Uh, it's a load sharing. No, the, go ahead. In the sense, my computer is shut down, so I can't read out or show you the slides. Fine. But what I'll do instead of wasting everybody's time, I'll just in a quick. Uh, kind of way, let me quickly summarize what I was going to talk about, and maybe then we can engage in some question answer. I'm so sorry. I no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, apologize please. to everybody. Uh, yeah. Sorry for wasting your time. Uh, so what I was going to kind of talk, I was talking about two diary and particularly the evolution of the two diary from 1861 and then particularly from the 1870s as they became more substantive. And by 1920s, they reached kind of a, almost an art form. Uh, and sometimes uh, with very slight editing, they used to get published. Uh, in in uh, if they're they were considered interesting, they used to get published in several journals, etc. It it became a, 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 a genre that traveled from the interior of the colonial state uh, to the to the public domain. But if we look at the so I was trying to think about how this particular form of two diary made the experience accessible. Right, it created a notion that the journey and whatever the officer was seeing and was of interest was being captured and distilled and reading it, the, uh, the, um, the readers uh, could, uh, could actually access that encounter. So that was a particularly, I think, a very, very important moment in the um, process of what I'm calling the invention of experience. Mm. And if we look at the kind of the mundane histories of these two diaries, what used to happen with the two diaries? Because I'm sure a lot of us have, have uh, looked at these, um, you know, as sources, but it's only much later that I, that I found out that these diaries were supposed to be read only by the chief commissioner. But when there was a new deputy commissioner or an uh, assistant commissioner, then sometimes the chief commissioner would lend this uh, to, to this new district officer to learn from the past. So this idea of what I was talking about earlier through Henderson, the idea of past as a public fund, as a public asset, um, uh, that it is not individual proprietary uh, kind of uh, uh, experience, but it is something that needs to be um, recycled and uh, and kind of reinvested in the government's memory, right? And and here the play with our play between archive and experiences is, is I think very very crucial. So that was one set of issues that I was kind of I thought that would be very interesting for thinking about the invention of. Uh, experience in the Northeastern frontier. The other uh, uh, part, of course, is the language, right? And uh, because until the middle of the uh, 19th century, Sananda, please let me know when I should stop. I, I, am, I can't see the time. I'm just speaking offhand. So please, you please can let continue. me know. You can continue. Yeah, you just continue. Please let me know. So yeah. the the Mm, the language question is obviously very, very interesting, right? Because from the what happened that until the 1850s, most of these officers had no formal training in these languages. And the way the Haleyberry kind of college servants were trained, they would be taught for uh, a few months two classical languages of India, Persian and Sanskrit in England. And they would learn the characters. They could barely read a book, and then they would be packed off to India. Most of the Assam officers would arrive in Calcutta, where they would stay for six months, and then they would be they would nominally enroll in Fort William College, but it didn't really have a proper uh, language instruction uh, course. So what happened? They would all hire native uh, interpreters, and then went for examination. Now, this kind of those who learned the language. Uh, were exception, and uh, particularly in the case of Assam, uh, not, not the rule. But this changed when the Public Service uh, uh, Commission 
uh, in uh, the 1880s, uh, kind of uh, tried to provincialize service and therefore increased kind of, it said that one sixth of the total post of the imperial post should go to the provincial service. And in all these kind of rejigging of the imperial bureaucracy, which they were trying to downsize uh, and kind of uh, racialize in a, in a less uh, um, explicit way, they, uh, the, one of the upshots of that was that now from 1887, the, uh, the departmental examinations insisted that learning the language of the district you are serving in is absolutely crucial for your departmental exam, which means that you can't be promoted unless you learn the language of the district you serve in. Now, there are two kind of interesting issues around this. One is obviously that there was a time uh, kind of, it was a time bound acquisition. You have to learn it while you are serving or at least within one year after you have left the district. Which meant that it was kind of, it was in Assam, the, all the plains district of Assam of the Brahmaputra Valley where obviously uh, the language was Assamese and Naga Hills was also classified as the vernacular as uh, Assamese. While all the Barak Valley uh, uh, districts, Kachar and Silet, as well as Gualpara, had Bengali as their uh, vernacular, and Garo Hills and Khasi Hills also had Bengali as their vernaculars, right? So what's happening is that because of the small, extremely small localized constituencies of these hill languages, what's happening is that the officers do not find it worth their time to learn the, the local at, at those points which were called the tribal languages, right? Because there was an additional 1,000 uh, rupee uh, reward if you would learn Singfo or um, Mishmi or uh, so on and so forth, right? Uh, 14, 14 language groups were identified, but those were optional. And because of the because of the low uh, um, extreme localization and, and small demographics of these languages, officers tended not to do that. So there was always a number game attached to hill languages. And at the same time, the government now insisted that give us vernacular information, give us vernacular information. We need to know what exactly the people are thinking. And as this kind of pressure increased and the officers began to get transferred also at a higher rate, um, the, what the officers did, they invested more and more in the institution of the interpreter, the Dobashis. And the massive rise in social status between 1890s and 1920s of these interpreters across the hill districts, but particularly in Naga and Lusha Hills. Uh, this happens at a, at a rate where the, the British kind of are depending on these Dobashis to learn uh, a few words and more importantly, to conduct expeditions and to organize the labor logistics, et cetera, et cetera. So there is another fascinating history of what this fluency in, in tribal languages actually meant, right? Uh, so uh, to cut a long story short, so I trace this story and then I talk about how after the 1919 uh, representative government coming uh, uh, the, with the coming of the representative government uh, in 1919, then the Assamese middle class began to vociferously protest against financing the uh, language projects of those small hill languages, which did not have uh, grammar books yet. So, you know, a uh, language like Galong or Idu or, or Miju, these would have to wait until the 1970s to get their first, uh, uh, um, you know, um, grammar books and, and, and lexicons. So the interesting thing is that the electoral logic as it entered the logic of, of frontier governance, it simultaneously kind of changed the community into a constituency. And there, particularly the numerically small 
groups continuously lost out. So the terrain of experience and this whole kind of myth about the uh, fluently uh, speaking uh, frontier officer constantly touring, always in touch, um, it, is, it is much more complex and, and quite unlike that, in fact, I, I, I suppose. So that's, that's the other point uh, that I wanted to me. And the final kind of, at the final uh, uh, point of my essay, what I was, uh, of my lecture, what I was kind of trying to point at, that how in 1927, with the coming of the Simon Commission and the kind of hardening of the representative government's uh, logic and the frontier officers, particularly led by John Henry Hutton, their determination to use the uh, representative logic to, to participate in the Simon Commission proceeding to claim autonomy, uh, uh, kind of paternalist autonomy for the excluded areas, the hill and tribal areas, uh, how there in that moment of manipulation, the whole notion of experience then began to travel once again to the notion of the mystic, of the inner truth of the community. And from 1907, the publication of the uh, tribe and caste monograph series and the uh, kind of the increasing importance of codification of customary law, et cetera, all these combined, and in the moment of 1927 to 30, we see in, in Simon Commission, then experience becomes another trope, another category from which now to claim that colonial rule does not understand us and from which to kind of claim a kind of a pre-discursive entity that is not subject to historical conditioning or structural conditioning. So in this way, I was trying to think about how experience started its career as a, an administrative category and was quite crucial in the functioning of the frontier bureaucracy, how it, it kind of mobilized the axis of uh, language and custom and kind of presented an, a readable, accessible form, presented experience as a linguistic event in the, uh, for, in the genre of two diary, and eventually how then this could be reappropriated by the new kind of emergent diction of I, uh, nativist identity, where they could take over some of the techniques and use the same black boxing to produce the exact opposite political result. So I guess I'll stop there. Hello. Yeah. Yes. yes. Ananda, yes. Please. So, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Bodhisattva, for your very interesting paper. And we lost out in between because of this whole dealing. And, you know, this is a problem. But anyway, it was a great advantage that you had been there. And still, we could have a very interesting talk by you. Uh, so it had been a new advantage given us by COVID-19. Otherwise, we would have tried to bring you here. Uh, but anyway, I would like to request the university authorities to make it possible that whenever he is here, so bring, it, bring him to Guwahati so that we can go on even on certain conversations. Uh, because uh, 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 experience of this kind is also very important. Online experience is good, but perhaps offline experience would be better for us. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, thank you for your very uh, interesting presentation. It's always a very... Uh, it's always very interesting to hear you and the best of it as our young, uh, younger scholars, uh, those who had not listened to you to earlier, uh, perhaps they can get the whole idea that how close you are to the, what we know as the very interesting and the most important sources, primary sources, and how to handle them and how to treat them and analyze them in view of the recent theoretical apparatus. So thank you, and he had taken a very broad theme since mid 19th century and up till he went up even after the post-colonial state. Uh, but yes, one particular point is that experience in the frontier areas is always very much a difficult way to deal with. 
uh, because the conventional tools and technologies of governance, as it works in the mainland and in the metropolitan areas, they does not work in the frontier areas. As we see even in 21st century, 2021, that still Afghanistan is a failed experience. And somehow, somewhere, it is always the experiences of the persons who had been there in 2001, 2002. Now they have been brought in in the TV discussions. All those retired bureaucrats, retired armies uh, to discuss about the Afghanistan scenario. So somehow, somewhere, uh, the problems and the governance of the frontiers, it always exists. Uh, to, that was something to have a broader comparative understanding. But anyway, uh, you had been talking about that as it was progressing since uh, the mid 19th century. And obviously, uh, when Nicholas Dux, he spoke about an ethnographic state, that India governance in India was taking the form of an ethnographic state after 1857. But perhaps in Northeast India, uh, governance was always the ethnographic state since its very inception. Even before 19, 1826, they were very much interested in having all those ethnographic details. And that's why the colonial experience of the ex-officers, it becomes so important because it was so diverse and so difficult for the officers to understand it. And it was so transforming. It was such a, in a fluid condition. And perhaps because of that one, as you told, that uh, those, those, uh, those experiences that had been written down, they had to be given to the younger officers so that they can have some hints how to go on with their colonial governance in their remote and difficult terrains. Uh, then you have been talking about uh, then those uh, David Scott and how the whole problems and that whole experience question started from that particular point onwards. And obviously, uh, the officers had to be exceptional. And that's why exceptional traits had to be attached to their experiences. And as you uh, framed it very rightly, that it was some kind of a black box as you framed it within the uh, theoretical writings of Bruno Latour and how experience had been framed in that particular point of view of the black blocks. And as it was some kind of a very opaque kind of a thing. Now, very interestingly, if you see what Sanjeev Borwa had been writing, that even in the 21st century, uh, we need the army officers to be governors of Assam or all these frontier provinces. It is because of their experiences, the experiences which is not 100% written down, but they had the experience, the state thinks that even in the post-colonial state, it is not the rule books. It is not a, It is not that, 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 that it is being written down. But somehow, somehow their personal understanding of the local things, and that's why uh, not the retired politicians, but even some very important officers who had that experience of dealing with insurgent groups, now they are being placed as governors. So it was very well written by Sanjeev that, that it's a continuity even in the post-colonial state. Uh, Anyway, I thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, request uh, our uh, audience. We had a whole lot of younger scholars. Uh, I think you should. You must have some questions, and uh, you can put it in the in the chat I box. I'm I'm calling now from the phone, so I can't see yeah, the yeah. chat. So if someone okay. can read it out, it'll be very okay, helpful. I, I really want to hear uh, the younger students. And thank you, Sonanda, for very perceptive comments as always. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Sonanda, can you see the questions? Yeah, I, I can see one question. Uh, yeah, please uh, go ahead and people will yeah. be writing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I request our uh, participants to please put your uh, questions in the chat box so that I can read it out to the research person. Uh, so first question is, Bodhisattva, can we assume that the experiences through the diaries vastly contributed to the future colonial administrative apparatus in the frontiers? Was it in a way catering to the needs of the forward policy? Yes. See, the, it's, a, it's a good question. It's something, there's no easy answer to this. Because on the one hand, obviously, the two diaries were supposed to be just a repository of the everyday experiences, right? By 1920, it was decreed that 120 days, the officer should be on the road in a year, right? Because road conditions have improved. Earlier, it couldn't be that much. 
Now, of these 120 days of a year, you have detailed entries, right? And sometimes nothing happens. There is absolute drudgery. There is just seas like sleep, flies, terrible weather, and uh, the officer signs off. But often there is some stuff obviously about disputes on taxation, um, adjudication of justice, more directly political administrative matters. Yes, of course, the two diaries are, are uh, very useful because a lot of, as I said, these two diaries used to be read by successive uh, commissioners, assistant commissioners and deputy commissioners, and always by the chief commission. But the two diaries had an official and unofficial status. I probably didn't mention this, which is to say that no action could be made on the basis of reading two diaries. So if the district officer noted something in the two diary and wanted something to be done, wanted an order to be issued, then they had to order order officially writing a separate letter to the chief commissioner. So two diaries are somewhat like the undergarments of the colonial state, right? They hold it together, but they are not always necessarily exposed. But sometimes if it is well-written and well-illustrated, like good lingerie, they are being displayed on the pages of Journal of Asiatic Society of Bengal. So the interesting, I like your question, but what you perhaps need to think is that what else does the work, what else does to, uh, to diary or the genre of to diary do instead of simply adding to the mechanism of, uh, uh, of the frontier machine, right? Because it also kind of is feeding into a lot of geological research. It's feeding into a lot of zoological, uh, botanical research and how those information are then kind of seized on by the administration. So it is never too far away from administration, but it is not simply only 100% administration. There are also strange stories of, you know, uh, I can tell you some funny stories about a haunted bungalow uh, somewhere in Naga Hills where three um, British officers claim to have seen the same dream. And they were very, very worried whether they themselves are turning into uh, primitives and savages. So there are all these kinds of lines of departure in the in the two diary that you can you can follow up. Uh, I have one question from Joydeep Borua. How do you how do the everyday experiences of the colonial officers have influenced historiography of the Northeast India? What is the problematic? that this has resulted in? Yes, see, the, uh, it's a great question, Jayadip, not with a, with a ready answer. The, the, I think if you look at our historiography, then we really do not have an everyday of the state kind of historiography. We have more anthropology of that in, in recent years, quite interesting works in anthropology. But in historiography, we really don't have the everyday of the state. But one important, and whenever history students are looking at the two diaries, uh, my sense is from whatever you know, articles I read or thesis I correct, my sense is that they're using it more it as a raw material rather than thinking of it in terms of its form and genre. Uh, that's why I wanted to highlight that. And I do think that that would be a very, very important kind of contribution to the historiography because usually, by overlooking the quotidian aspect where we have landed up is a very essentialized, homogenized, almost predetermined logic of exceptionalist state. And I think uh, the, this kind of organization of the everyday in the form of a governmental duty with all its shortcomings still opens up, uh, you know, I think avenues to think of a much more anxiety-ridden, to think of a much more confused, befuddled state. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, there's one question from Caroline Hamilton. She says that you were talking about the diaries, but she talks about what about other forms of unofficial collected resources that frontier officers relied on, resources that circulated among themselves. It might be least compendia, place names list taken down from local people, 
that field officers turned into public goods to be passed into succession. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. In the job, uh, etc. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. That. That's a. That's obviously a very, very important, Im, 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 important item. But I, I, I singled out two diary because I think it was something interesting about actually recording the dailiness of, uh, of, of, of the world uh, that the officers are visiting, which is not always, sometimes they are, but not always present in all the other forms that, that you are talking about. And I, I seize on this precisely because there is a notion of every day that works in this black box of experience where the officers kind of particularly, you know, I couldn't read out that bit, but when in 1927, they are negotiating with a commission where there are members who are trying to expand uh, a regular normative law of the country into some of these areas and the officers who are resisting this and uh, batting for, uh, for paternalist uh, excluded uh, uh, jurisdiction, uh, they are often kind of talking about the days, right? How many days they have spent and how closely. And in a way, I think that is, uh, that is something interesting uh, that the form of the diary does because it almost creates a subject uh, position uh, through the, the invitation of the form is to create a subject position uh, into which different empirical officers can sleep in and when transferred, sleep out but it almost makes the state an experiencing subject. And that I think is, is particularly uh, kind of uh, specific and unique about the two diaries. Yeah, Budhi, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you're talking about two diaries, but what she was asking, perhaps those yearly administrative reports, specifically those sent from the frontier officers, uh, those reports can be read as some kind of a uh, diaries of those uh, administrative diaries, not personal diaries, which that speak about the personal day to day sure. things. Sure, sure. No, no. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't push to diary to exclude other uh, yeah, yeah. forms of knowledge. True, 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 true. I'm I just. Yeah, yeah. True, true. But perhaps she was I'm expanding, just... expanding it. She was expanding it. Yeah, that's right. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I'm uh, just saying that it, it kind of gives us a template. Maybe uh, it'll be interesting if we think more about the genre to what other genres these genre have an impact. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, then we have uh, another question from Medu Smita. Earlier, what was instructed for the frontier officers as to achieving psychological integration, empathy, it is quite contrary to the oppressive nature of administration of the colonial rule. Kindly comment. Sorry, I couldn't get the question. Exactly. What uh, is the yeah, question? I, yeah, I am reading it again. Earlier, what was instructed for colonial frontier officers as to achieving psychological integration, empathy, it is quite contrary to the oppressive nature of administration of the colonial rule. Perhaps he was saying that, no, this was the two things. One was that uh, some sort of an integrity and empathy should be there. At the same yeah. time, I mean, when you read yeah. Nehru's lectures, when you read his kind of, you know, memos that he's sending out to these uh, experts of tribal areas, it's all full of such uh, very big words. But as I said, that, you know, and if you read some of the colonial memos, if you read Hutton, if you read uh, McCabe, if you read uh, Woodthorpe, all of them, uh, they don't say we want to kill and burn and, and, and rape the tribe. Uh, uh, the uh, tribal men and women. They say we want to protect, we want to appreciate, we want to civilize, we want to, that's the form of paternalism, right? So in a way, the diction and the practice can be very different. And that is why I brought up the issue that why then, you know, if this psychological approach um, was actually being ped or practiced in the frontier in the 50s, then how would we uh, look at the imposition of AFSPA, uh, you know, in, in uh, 1958? How, why would they have to go back to a British experienced officer like Charles Posse and secretly fly him to Nagaland to actually convince the, uh, the middling villages? So 
what I'm trying to say is that it is obviously there are shifts, but there are shifts also within colonial bureaucracy. There are shifts within post-colonial bureaucracies and there are continuities because some of these forms like two diary, right? It is still maintained. Uh, uh, they were maintained quite uh, very prosaically, much, much less poetically than colonial times, but quite rigorously uh, in the 60s. Uh, I haven't seen 70s two diaries, but 50s and 60s two diaries I've seen. And, and uh, they're quite substantive and quite aping uh, the mm. colonial uh, style. So the idea is perhaps not to take these political labels uh, prima facie, but to look at the specific work that each configuration of power does. So what, uh, so just because a state says I'm protecting you, the actual reality on the ground may not be so, right? Yes, Bhuti, uh, the whole uh, idea of I'm trying to understand the frontier governance, I think again, it is not a monolithic experience uh, from the post-colonial point of view. When you were talking about Nehru, obviously he was influenced by Elwin's uh, ideas. And when Elwin was writing philosophy for Nefa, that is also true. At the same time, Abspa also came up. So these are two different trends which was happening simultaneously. Sure. There are always, there are always lofty ideals, not necessarily they're, they're empty, but those lofty ideals are always muddled by more profane practice. And I think that is true of most political conditions. Yeah, there's another one. Uh, how British administrators successfully handled the diverse ethnic tradition through their well-planned policy. The Jotin Mets. Well, that's, that'll take a book, Jotin. Yeah, true, true, true. <laughs> yeah, that'll take a book. A, so maybe, uh, maybe <laughs> all we can say is that, that they were trying, they were not simply, they were not simply recording and managing. They were also producing uh, these identities in lots of very influential ways, right? The, in the ways they uh, arranged their settlement policies, the way they taxed, the, the way they fixed particular dressing, the way they disburred them from building different kinds of houses. They were often solidifying particular identities into the ethnic categories they themselves invented. So this is not a simple process of managing. It's much more interestingly a process of creating. Yeah, Bodhi, now we have one question from Fuiton. Professor Kerr, do you think the experience of the men on the spot were mostly fragment in nature? Hence, it was difficult for the Raj to translate those experiences into universalizing projects of imperial strategies in the frontier governance. Fantastic question. Thank you. Uh, I would say I would I would uh, I have thought about this, and my immediate response would be that let's look at the myth of the man on the ground, right? What I was trying to, because there is always in the colonial archive, there is always this kind of metaphysics of the man on the ground, right? Every time there is a policy pushback, anyone wants to contest something, they're always doing it on the man on the ground, right? Now, if we unpack this, and in a way that is true, but what is important to understand that man on the ground does not have an immediate access to the reality. The man on the ground, like the man in the chamber, uh, accesses this world through certain narrative frames, through certain semantic codes, through certain ideological and discursive practices. And those practices and those, um, those protocols also shape the individual subjective encounter of the person who might be in the uh, remotest uh, outpost of the frontier. So to think of experience as something pre-discursive, as something untainted by ideology, as something untrammeled by narrative, will be to set up exactly a certain kind of, you know, that's exactly what I'm trying to problematize. But what you are asking, I think, is a, is a very interesting question. Uh, 
that why could some of these ideas emanating from these locations could translate into global projects and why certain others could not. And I think that is exactly where the unevenness of power uh, needs to be mapped and, and spelled out by historians on a case by case basis. So thank you for that question. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think uh, we don't have much questions. Uh, I would like to thank Buddha. I think everyone is bored, but thank no, no, you for- bored. They asked lots of questions. Uh, and everyone, I am, I'm sure everyone uh, liked it very much. And because it was really very, very interesting. Uh, towards the end, I just want to uh, come up one particular point. What uh, in a recent book by Thomas Simpson, uh, he was writing about the frontier in British India space, science, and power in the 19th century. And he was suggesting that uh, uh, by the late 19th century, uh, when the whole, the whole process of governance, of knowing and governing, it had already encompassed the whole of British possessions. The agents of empire widely constructed India's frontier at what Michel Foucault has termed as spiritual spaces. And, and, and he said that uh, the British agents of empire concept of the frontiers as productively strands. And perhaps this transness and whatever uh, that it was very difficult to comprehend, it remained in most of the British writings. And that's why uh, the British frontiers were troubled as much by the extension of conventional forms of imperial power as the excessive challenges that frontiers often presented. It is Simpson's understanding because it was continuously on the flux. It was so difficult terrain to rule and to be disciplined. And perhaps that's why uh, the whole experience and experiences of everyone from 1850s to 1950s. And still, we think even in the post-colonial period, uh, the experience of each and every officer, it still counts to go for the next stage. Thank you so much, Bodhi. Thank you. Joy Deep. Medusmita, you are not audible. Huh? Yeah, you are audible. No, no, please speaking. No, 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 no. Does it take a headphone logo as an again? Oh, anyway, so so we cannot hear you. So you you know it is actually the formal vote of thanks she was supposed to be giving. Uh, so uh, let me you know since uh, she has some problem with her you know audio, so let me thank uh, uh, the, all the participants and also the you know the other guests who have uh, joined us today for this wonderful lecture. And uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, Bodhi in particular and Chandanda also for you know, having um, an excellent discussion on, a, you know, on an exciting and a very amazing lecture. And thank you. Uh, and then we hope that probably we will have occasions to meet again physically uh, in future. And then we'll have uh, occasion to discuss some of these issues. And I also would like to thank all my colleagues in the university uh, authority and IT cell and uh, everyone for joining us today and making this success. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, so thank you very much, Joydeep, and I apologize again for the technical fault on my side, uh, but it has been wonderful, and I'm really, really grateful. That thank you, you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much, thank you, Sandanda.